Hey everyone and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to dive into episodes 370 through 372, which will cover manga chapters 475 through 479. And at least we get a lot more chapters this time. This four chapters. So, yay. But it's all action, so it goes by pretty fast. So this episode is actually going to be pretty short compared to the most of the other ones. But yeah, as we inch closer to the end of the conflict, it's getting very dire for the Strong Hats as they throw everything they have at Oars and Moria to weaken them enough for Luffy when he arrives. Alright, so synopsis. With the arrival of Brook and his salt, it's now an all-out survival for the Straw Hat crew to somehow subdue Oars enough for them to feed him the salt. But with all of Moria's power, this is proving to be near impossible. But with the help of some displaced pirates, Luffy is able to return to the fight. Okay, so differences. Just a few of them in these episodes. The beginning of episode 372 where Zoro takes on oars is extended to fill a bit more time. As in the manga, it goes from Zoro telling Usopp that he'll make an opening for him. Then it immediately cuts him to doing the Yaksha Garasa attack. Whereas in the anime, there's like an added like three minutes or so worth of extra scenes of Zoro fighting. Next, similarly, this is actually a very small change. I'm not even sure why they made this change. But in the manga, just before Zoro is finished off by Zoro's knee, Zoro tries to brace himself by attempting a Toragari. But in the anime, this is completely missing as he just immediately gets hit. And again, I'm not sure why they removed this because this kind of shows that Zoro is a fast thinker and was fighting to the very end. It's literally like two extra seconds, but they cut it for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why, but in the manga, there is clearly a panel of Zoro getting ready to do Toragari as the knee is like about to like hit him in the entire body. Um, but yeah, it's it's just gone for some reason. And then lastly, when Luffy finishes the Gomu Gomu no Storm and is falling back to the ground, in the manga, it already shows a lot of the shadows kind of leaking out from him as he's falling. However, in the anime, the shadows don't start leaving till after he's already on the ground. And what's weird is they show the exact same shot that the panel where all the shadows are leaking out from him. It's kind of this like from the ground looking up shot as Luffy's falling towards the camera. And yeah, in the manga, you see all the shadows leaking out. But for some reason in the anime, they don't animate the shadows coming out of him. It's just the same shot, but he's just falling to the ground and you don't see the shadows kind of leaking out of him until he's already on the ground. Again, a very strange change, but it doesn't really change anything all that much. But yeah, it's just something I noticed. So that's it for the differences. So let's move on to the episodes themselves. So to begin, this initial exchange between Brooke and Usopp about the effectiveness of just drinking milk for healing bones is hilarious because... Of course, milk doesn't work that way. I mean, yeah, there's the age-old sort of uh, adage that drinking milk is healthy for your bones. But this is taking it a little too far. Um, But maybe that's part of Brook's devil fruit powers, that milk does work wonders for him. I don't know, something to think about. (laughs) And again, we get to see even more combo attacks from the crew as Frankie and Usopp pair up to fire a super firebird star as well as Zoro and Chopper also working together. But have you noticed how uncomfortably long Zoro is running at Chopper while Chopper is just sort of intently staring back at him? <laughs> I don't know I don't know why, but this just it, it's it's really bad in the anime. Like it just takes him forever to get to Chopper even though Zoro is like running full speed and they're not that far away from each other. I also found the comically titled Jenga cannon attack that Sanji it uses is pretty funny. Uh, I don't really have anything more to say about that. I just thought the title of the, this attack was pretty funny. But that fun doesn't last too long as Frankie takes a massive hit from Oars after getting close enough to attempt an attack on Moria. And Frankie's in real trouble as Oars and Moria want to finish him off. But someone has come to save the day with an epic hero entrance as Nami's climb attack shows up to blast Oars with a thunderbolt tempo. This gives them an opening to save Frankie, but in Sanji's crazy excitement, it gives away Nami's location. And some truly worrisome things happens as Oars goes to attack Nami. He uses Gomu Gomu no pistol, but this time his arm 
actually stretched like it does with Luffy, as if he actually has gom the gom gom no fruit. Initially, it looks like a direct hit on Nami, and even if it wasn't, Nami would still be in danger of falling off of all that. And one detail I like about this moment that sort of reinforces that theme of Zoro feeling responsible for protecting everyone in the crew is how in this moment, this is the first time we actually see Zoro kind of shocked and scared. Like his face is visibly scared because at this moment he thought he let Nami get killed or at least gravely injured. And luckily Robin is there to rescue her though. And one thing I have to mention again is how underutilized Robin is in many situations. She does get a lot more to do here in Thriller Bark, which is cool to see. But yeah, she has a super useful and powerful fruit. But most of the time, she's just there to kind of dump exposition or to perform these sort of rescue moments of the other crew. I know it's hard to juggle nine different main characters, but I really wish Oda would involve Robin in a few more cool ways, especially during combat, rather than always relegating her to just kind of like support roles. Anyways, mini rant aside, getting back to the fight, Zoro quickly deduces that Moria is doing something to affect Oars, and now it really does look like the Strong Hats have to face a monstrous version of their captain. And this is an interesting dynamic as we get to see how the crew would fare against their own captain. Sort of. And speaking of the captain, we finally get to see what the hell Luffy has been doing while his Nakama are getting there, as is handed to them by Shichibukai and his pet monster. He's stopped by a random pirate crew, no doubt other victims of Moria's traps, but this crew says they know a way to defeat Moria, and, is, and this crew turns out to be none other than Lola's crew, the real human Lola, the one with the shadow where she got stolen and put into the boar version. And turns out she's pretty much exactly like the zombie's Lola, but she's the captain of her crew, which explains why... Zombie Lola was decently strong and also hell-bent on finding a husband. As we find out, she's proposed over 4,443 times, so this woman is literally braving the seas as a pirate just to find a husband. <laughs> so it's pretty brutal for her. And she does also propose to Luffy, which makes him the 4,444th person. Anyways, they then reveal a very interesting piece of information regarding the shadows that Moria separates as they can be caught by normal humans, which is weird. But even more interesting is that they can temporarily fuse a shadow into a living person as long as they can mentally and physically handle it. The shadows add to the person's strength, knowledge, and skills, and they gain all of that after they've been fused. Naturally, they then just stuff Luffy with a hundred shadows, <laughs> creating something truly monstrous that we don't quite get to see yet. We'll get back to that in a bit. And I remember how hyped this moment was seeing what Luffy would become with that kind of power-up. He's clearly gotten bigger and buffer and can now use swords and weapons apparently because he's got one kind of like slung on his shoulder. Lola then dubs him the incredibly awesome moniker of Nightmare Luffy. Like, what an awesome name. I remember hearing this and thinking, oh my god, I can't wait to see this thing in action. But yeah, going back to the other conflict, now armed with the powers of the Gomu Gomu no Mi, thanks to Moria's manipulation, Ors is just beating up on the Strong Hats now. Moria has a pretty cool utilization of his shadow powers, where usually the shadows obviously have to match the physical body, but Moria is stretching the shadow, making the physical body match the shadow using his shadow revolution technique. I just love how insanely unique and creative Oda utilizes his superpowers. Like, they're always used in such weird and unexpected ways, but also kind of make sense. In an effort to slow Oars down, they do another awesome four person combo attack led by Brooke. This time with Usopp's huge Kuagata slingshot assisted by Robin and enhanced with Nami's lightning tempo which all culminate in a piercing attack called Lightning Bone Sword Gavat Bon and Avant. That's a really hard move to say which is a long but awesome name. Of course all of Brooke's attack names are themed like everyone else although his is obviously themed after musical terms. And after looking it up Gavat is a fast paced French folk dance. And Bon en Avant is French for leap forward. 
And it's also apparently a technique used in fencing. So it makes sense since Brook uses a lot of sort of thrusting fencing type attacks. Usually it's used to propel oneself to their opponent to attack, which this quite literally is propelling his entire body. Uh, also, another note on moves. Usopp's Kuwagata is Japanese for Stag Beetle, continuing his theme of naming his attacks or his weapons after Japanese beetles, following his new slingshot, the Kabuto, which, as you all recall, is the Japanese term for the Rhinoceros Beetle. This attack allows him to inflict a bit more damage on ores, but it's left Brook vulnerable, and again we see Usopp leaping without a, without a thought to help when someone is in real danger as he fires off an Atlas Comet to draw ores away from Brook. But then, like always, immediately he regrets it as ores goes for Gomu Gomu no Bazooka, and in this moment, Usopp's basically accepted his death. And, and Kape Yamaguchi scream here, I don't know why it's so hilarious, but it's probably the most visceral scream he's ever uttered by <laughs> Usopp, and it's so funny. I can't even like attempt to imitate it, but it is so like almost like guttural sc- screaming for Usopp. But he is luckily saved by Robin's quick thinking in a great flash of her powers, restricting Moria's movements to prevent him by trapping him and eventually using clutch on him to attempt to snap his neck. Which, when you think about it, is pretty brutal. Again, kind of alluding to Robin's sort of darker side, having no qualms about killing another person in such a horrific way. But this does fail as Moria busts out another aspect to his shadow fruit, as he can swap places with his shadow clones and steals Robin's shadow, knocking her out. And this is getting bad now, as Frankie, Brooke, and now Robin are all down for the count. It's becoming very apparent that even with their combined strength, there's still no match for Ors and Moria. Oh, before we continue though, a couple translators notes about Robin's techniques here. So, Vientiflor or 20 Flowers Calendula, which we saw actually back on Skypea versus Yama, where she sprouts 20 arms, 10 on each side, to create basically small shields to protect herself. And Calendula means marigold in Spanish. And then she goes on to use a technique called cuatro manos, literally meaning four hands. Or if you look at the kanji in Japanese, it reads four trees, which is a follow-up to her um, ochenta flower, which is the 80 flowers. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Where she combines her 80 arms into four larger ones to restrain Moria. Moving on. Kanji then moves in to protect Robin in an epic fashion with a new move called Frit Assorti, which is just French for assorted fried food, which is reflected in the fact that his leg is on fire, obviously, referring to the fried part from the Diablo Jambe. And then he kicks in multiple directions at the same time, which is the Assorti part, I'm assuming. This move just looks cool to me, as it seems like they kind of have this sort of like spiraling tornado effect on each kick, which is really cool. Chopper then gets to shine, showcasing his medical background by analyzing Ors and determining Ors' original cause of death being freezing to death and losing an arm to frostbite because he was too stupid to wear any clothes in the freezing weather. (laughs) And I like this part. Like, I love that Chopper is getting to use a lot of his medical sort of know-how in this fight. I mean, I know it's pretty common in Chopper, but I feel like it's really starting, it's shining here in this arc. And we'll see later on, too, this aspect of Chopper's effectiveness really being showcased here. Now they plan on taking out one of the reconstructed arms, but those plans are quickly dashed as Ors instantly takes out Sanji and Chopper with a devastating Gomu Gomu no Gatling, ending episode 371 with two more Straw Hats down, leaving the first three members. And yeah, when you think about it, with the slight exception of Frankie going down before Brooke, They've more or less been going down in the reverse order they joined the crew, which could be looked at thematically as Luffy's shadow poetically and systematically dismantling the crew that Luffy himself has built up. Just thought that was a really interesting thing. I don't, I'm, I'm assuming that was intentional by Oda. At this point, Zoro determines this is probably their last chance, so he tells Usopp that he'll create an opening for him, which I think is awesome that even in this scenario that he still trusts enough to basically sacrifice himself to give Usopp the best chance to end this. 
And I love moments like this because it truly separates One Piece from other series, in my opinion. In many other series, this moment would be like a cliche, I'll handle this by myself and sort of let the weaker people do nothing. But not only is Zoro not expecting to be the hero of this moment, his ego isn't so big that and he has enough trust in his nakama to give himself up because he trusts the two physically weakest members to come through in this pinch. It's such a great subtle character detail. And on Usopp's side, he's at first confused, but once he figures out what Zoro is talking about, he doesn't cower or hesitate as this newly developed Usopp is fully confident in his place on the crew and confidently acknowledges Zoro that he knows exactly what to do and does it. And such an amazing and like culminating moment from all the way back when they were basically fighting against Kaku and Jabra on Enya's lobby as well as Sanji's pep talk and then Usopp basically re-fortifying that in his fight against Perona here. And so this ultimate culmination right here is pretty damn cool in my opinion. Continuing to target that right arm, Zoro uses a brand new Santoryu move called the Yaksha Garasu or the Yaksha Crow. And this move is really cool as he creates three prongs by crossing his swords and rapidly rolls up Orz's arm creating slash wounds that look like bird footprints running up his arm that each start spewing blood everywhere. And from my brief research, Yaksha is referring to a kind of spirit or demon in Buddhism and the kanji literally means night fork which is basically what the move is doing cutting a bunch of little forks into you and... It's also likely Oda is playing on the pun of the name Yatagarasu here as well, which is a three-legged crow in Japanese folklore. And again, when you look at how the wounds look on Oris' arm, it does indeed look like a three-legged crow ran up it. But eventually, even Zoro is taken down as he takes a brutal knee into a wall, but this gives Usopp the opening he needed to get the bag of salt from Brook into Oris' mouth. And they really get you though, thinking at least they may have taken out Oars, leaving Moria for when Luffy arrives, but Oda actually got me with this one, as Moria sent his shadow clone in Oars' mouth to catch it before he swallows it. Usopp and Nami look like they're going to be smashed, but then get saved by Luffy, as he's finally back just in time to save Nami and Usopp. But he looks insane. Like a bl- blue Hulk version of himself due to all the shadows stuffed into him by Lola. And Mayumi Tanaka is really stretching her voice changing abilities as she's playing oars as well as this modified Luffy voice too. Immediately it's clear that the power of those hundred shadows is really doing the trick as he just stops oars' punch dead in its tracks and knocks him on his ass. Like holy shit. <laughs> This is a Luffy that we've never seen before. Nightmare Luffy is the real deal, and it's freaking awesome. This moment in the manga is illustrated so amazingly in the manga, with the punch stopping, taking like 40% of a two-page spread, with a bunch of shocked reactions from everyone else taking up the other portions. And the way the punch side of the panel is shown with so much speed and force is great but then the other side of the page is completely still with even the background just being complete white to show stillness and yeah I always thought this conveyed just how much force Nightmare Luffy stopped so well and then the next two pages is another you know full two page spread showing Luffy counter punching oars right on his ass and it's truly gorgeous like these four pages are awesome to see in the manga and it does look pretty cool in the anime as well i mean they they do a really good job of showing just luffy just stopping that punch and it's pretty awesome in both versions and also i have to mention his look i think borrows a little from frankenstein's monster a, a bit too even though i know obviously nightmare luffy is blue and most depictions of frankenstein are like gray or green now that I think about it, yeah, that's also how the Hulk is often depicted. Interesting. Um, anyways, but yeah, I couldn't help but make the connection. Nightmare Luffy is just manhandling oars like a rag doll at this point, but with only two to three minutes left of this power up, it does still seem like a little up in the air whether Luffy can win. And Oda reminds us of this as he flashes a shot of Kuma as well for good measure, but for now 
He's inflicting some heavy damage on both Ors and Moria with an awesome sword slash and finishing off with a huge nightmare Gomu Gomu no Storm. And this is probably my second favorite instance of this attack as it just shows Nightmare Luffy mercilessly drilling into Ors and Moria. And this moment in both the anime and the manga are done superbly. It looks so cool. And yeah, they've done it. As everyone cheers in joy and excitement that Nightmare Luffy has finally defeated Ors and Moria. Or have they? <laughs> I don't know. It seems a little too easy, doesn't it? Not to mention there's still the looming threat of Kuma. But I guess we'll have to wait and see on the next set of episodes and the next podcast to go over all of that. So we'll leave it at that. But yeah, if you did enjoy this, send me a like or comment. And if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Check out my Instagram and Twitter account at SunnyGoPodcast if you want updates of when I post new episodes or see pictures of my manga collection. I've also been streaming on Twitch. So if you want to come chat or watch me play games, I'd be happy to see you at twitch.tv slash sunny underscore underscore go. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to listen to my podcast. Just a really brief spoiler section after this. But if you're not interested in that, stay safe out there and I hope to see you on the next episode. Bye. Alrighty, so very, very brief spoiler section, and I don't even think it really warrants a spoiler section, but I do talk about some stuff that happens much, much later on, so I decided to just throw this in here. But it's something I wanted to kind of talk about, and I know this gets revealed pretty quickly, at least part of it, and most people watching this already figured it's not the end, but I'll, you know, again, I'll just put it here. I find it really funny how Oda plays up the fake out victory several times in this arc. And I think, again, he's playing on that sort of horror movie trope where you think you've defeated the monster or villain, but nope, they just get right back up in the very same movie or they eventually keep coming back in sequels. And yeah, I think, again, he's just playing up sort of that horror movie trope. And yeah, you see it a lot with like Michael Myers in Halloween or Jason in Friday the 13th or Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, all those, etc. But Oda takes it kind of almost to an absurd and hilarious level as he fakes you out like four to five times towards the end here. First with the salt being caught in Oars' mouth, then later on with, with Nightmare Luffy, you know, with the Gomu Gomu no Storm victory here in these episodes. But then with the defeat of Oars, but... Right after that, then Moria gets back up, and now they have to deal with Moria. But then once Moria is defeated for good, then Kuma shows up. And so you just get these like cascading fake-out victories over and over and over before we get to a final conclusion. And yeah, I think this is all really just Oda having fun with that sort of that um, horror movie trope of the villains <laughs> just keep coming back. Anyways, I just wanted to point that out. But yeah. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you on the next episode. See ya.